Andries Fenter is the Chief Inspector of the Cape of Good Hope Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, one of 93 SPCAs in South Africa. Fenter and his 10 inspectors cover an area of 9,000 square miles of the Western Cape from their base at Grassy Park in Cape Town. The, re the reason is people taking dogs or animals. Fenter uh, briefs his team on their assignments for the day. The area inspector, he doesn't know how many dogs are involved or where they are. It will be your case. You will follow through. You will ensure that within seven days those animals are dealt with accordingly. Are there any questions? The inspectors hit the road. Fenter will handle the biggest job himself, alongside Inspector James Murray, known as Fox. They're following up on a case Fox investigated yesterday. Went inside, sort of feces and that all over the house, three pit bulls in the back. So I spoke to the guy, asked him if there were any more animals in the house, sort of made it very clear to him that if there were and he was lying to me, we would sort of seek a warrant for his arrest and press charges against him. Late last night, Fox received a call from the owner of the rented house, saying she'd gone there with the police and they'd found nine dogs hidden around the property. Something's going on there and they're determined to find out what. Control coming, control. Go for control. Fenter will get a warrant to seize the animals. Fox will arrange police backup and they'll meet at the house. The two police officers will make sure there's no trouble, and the property owner has come to find out exactly what her tenants have been up to. Okay, we're going to search all the cupboards, the whole house, all right. This is where they wouldn't let me into. Yeah, you can see there have been more dogs in here. Conditions are filthy. What stinks for you, so? The stench is too much for one of the police officers. Yeah, this place is filthy. This young woman and her boyfriend rent the house. The property owner's not happy with what she's seeing here, and neither is Fenter. The cats are extremely thin. The three dogs outside, the space for, for pit bulls is inadequate. Outside, there are three pit bulls confined to a filthy yard. For some reason, six more dogs that were here yesterday have been removed. Fenter is starting to get suspicious. The fact that the police officer found nine dogs and we only find three dogs, or well, four with, with a puppy now, is, is a big problem. We've got three pit bulls covered in urine, covered in feces. I wrote a warning for this yesterday, telling them that it needs to be cleaned up. Absolutely nothing has changed. Filthy conditions, totally unhygienic, parasitic. Jeez. The general conditions, it is disgustingly filthy. What the hell is this? It looks like the insides of an animal that's being eaten by maggots or something. I don't know how anyone can, can live like this. Basically what you're standing on is feces that's been stepped in. This is disclosing. I mean this is winter and that fly trap is full. How do you live like this? It's hard to explain this situation. Hello. Fenter's first thought is that maybe these people have a compulsion to collect animals but don't know how to care for them. My suspicion is that we might caught this just in time for hoarding. I'm glad we, we came now rather than later. I'm removing all the animals on this property. I am not leaving them here. These people can't even look after themselves, never mind their animals. Nothing's changed since I issued the warning. Start rounding them up. Inspector Wilbur Kinkabe has arrived from base to help load the animals and record photographic evidence. This is a serious offense in terms of the Animal Protection Act as well as all the other animals, the kittens, the, the mice, and the cockatiel. Chief Inspector Fenter makes sure the young woman knows exactly how serious this is. His cage is hanging against a cold wall. It's winter. These birds die for nothing. Oh, 
Okay, release, release. In terms of the Animals Protection Act, there's a crime that's, that's been committed here. And the crime is that animals are living in unhygienic, parasitic conditions, which is unacceptable. The place has not been cleaned, the place has not been maintained. Dogs have been kept confined in small cages, small spaces, for reasons beyond our understanding. If you cannot give us a reasonable e e explanation, charges of cruelty will be laid against both you and whoever else lives in this house. As they are preparing to leave, Fenter makes a disturbing discovery. There's blood on this wall. Is there? Oh, that's... Jeez. That's blood there as well, eh? Do you think they've been fighting them in here? There's more blood on the wall here as well. Yes. That's definitely blood. It suggests two things. Either that a dog or dogs got into a huge fight in this corner and there was blood all over, or it suggests that fighting could have taken place. Um, intentional fighting. Wayne Hector's a trainee inspector at the Cape of Good Hope SPCA. Wayne was working in the maintenance department when Chief Inspector Fenter asked him if he'd like to have a go at becoming an inspector. Wayne jumped at the chance. I've been doing the job now for, for just more than a year. I started off as an animal collector, so that's why I know what the areas are like and I know what type of animals you get in certain areas. And this is the area where you will see that there's, there's a lot of neglected animals. Wayne's approaching the end of his training period and soon he'll find out whether he's made the grade. I enjoy the work. If I can qualify as an inspector, uh, it will be for me a great achievement. You get such a lot of cruelty towards animals and what drives me is that I, I've got the powers to actually improve animals' welfare. Today, Wayne's been detailed to check on a stables south of the city. First impressions aren't good. You can see on the flooring here, if, 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 a, if a horse is taken out of here, um, objects lying around here, it's very dangerous. Um, it could injure the horse and could, it could break a leg if you step onto a, one of these blocks. Inside, there are six hackney ponies. They look like show ponies or pets, rather than working horses which makes it all the more surprising that their living conditions are so poor. Very dark conditions here. Um, we've got a dark bay here, we've got one at the back, and we've got another stallion here. The bedding is not so nice, it's wet, and the conditions of the bedding, it's very unhygienical, and you get the smell of urine, and that's not acceptable for us to keep a horse in. And as you can see also, um, what I'm point, pointing out is the nails protruding here. Wayne's not happy with the stables, but he sees signs that the owner does care for his animals. The conditions are not bad of the horses. They've been fed well, they're not underweight. But the only problem here is the, the sheltering. A horse actually needs a, a minimum three by three meters for, for stabling. Also, it needs to be waterproof. As you can see, the bedding is soaking wet. Could be that the water is getting in here. The owner of the ponies is not at home. So Wayne decides to leave a notice detailing the changes that need to be made. I'm going to tell him to contact me. We're going to try to improve the conditions of the horses. Uh, and if he doesn't do it on purpose, then it, it, it says that um, he's purposefully keeping the horses under these conditions. I hope that's not the case because after that, then we'll have to take it further for the sake of the animals. The owner's got 24 hours to respond. And whatever happens, Wayne will be back to make sure things improve. at a house in the Woodstock area of Cape Town. SPCA Chief Inspector Andries Fenter and Inspector Fox Murray have discovered evidence of dog fighting. At first, they thought the filthy conditions were signs of animal hoarding. Now it looks like these rooms have been used as pit bull fighting arenas. Yeah, there's more blood in that here. Oh my goodness. Come look here, boss. Well, back of the door is absolutely covered in blood. You can see it's dried, dripping down the walls there, blood splatter. And I mean, at that height, 
It's a get. I mean, that, those sort of markings on, on the wall, I mean, you can only imagine that there were animals ripping each other apart. You can see how the dogs have chewed. Look how they've almost tried to chew through the door to get out. What we found thus far from the front, as well against the wall there, the height of that blood spatter right around suggests that this room or house was used as a dog fighting ring. Quite difficult to actually almost express the way you feel when you come into circumstances like this and see things like this. Because that's why we're here, to fight for those that have no voice for themselves. And if we weren't here, who would actually ever find places like this and actually put a stop to it? The fact that we happened to stumble upon this purely because of the condition of the house suggests that this was ignorance. This, and, and it amazes me the lengths that we go in putting it out there that it's illegal to fight dogs. It's just beyond my belief. Outside, the property owner shows Fox another pit bull she's found. To block it up from us, probably see. Now they're thinking this could be the center of an organized fighting and breeding operation. This looks like where they were keeping some of the pit bulls, some of the females in that part of the breeding. Okay. Oh, ah. Get, here we go. The dog itself is not a bad breed, it's not a bad dog. Um, it's, it's the temper, uh, temperament towards other dogs and the way the dogs are raised. These ears have been freshly cut. It's illegal to um, crop any ears. It's to do with dog fighting. It prevents them from grabbing at each, each other's ears and, and, and tearing it. Now neighbors have confirmed that they knew about the dog fights. If, if we have to take these people to court, would you be prepared to testify to what you've actually seen? Yes, I I've got someone that's prepared to testify to actually seeing them set dogs on each other and fighting that's taking place. Excellent, nice. excellent. The cops can take their statements. Yeah. Dog fighting is illegal in South Africa. The SPCA will be working closely with the police on this case. She's a witness to dog fighting. One of the rooms was definitely used as a, as a dog fighting ring. If you can be so kind as to take the lady's affidavit from what, what she saw, because we will be, um, from what we found, we will be laying charges. This is why we do the job, eh? It's to sort of try to find these places and prosecute these people so that people learn that there are actually consequences to, to crimes of animals, hey? And just sort of no respect and, I don't know. It's a bit it's sad, really. It's very sad. But hopefully we can nail them to the wall. Trainee inspector Wayne Hector is back at the stables north of Cape Town. And this time, he's brought senior inspector James Murphy with him. Full. They want to see whether the owner has made the improvements Wayne asked for. Even even you complain them and don't complain. Uh, this is stupid. Man. Uh, I mean, it's just uncalled for. You were supposed to have changed the bedding, but I mean, um, it's so hard you can't even dig it out. Bedding and the, the space that this horse has leaves a lot to be desired at this stage. But this is the was like dice dice shavings. There are some fresh wood shavings on the floor, but not much else seems to have changed. All the blooming bedding was wet. Yeah. So it's pointless bringing wet bedding in here. You try to keep it, your stables dry. Why don't you put some in down here then? It'll oh. make life easier. The, the oh, well, how about those paving slabs? Yeah. <laughs> hey, not. And these nails should be avoided. Knock it flat. Okay. Easy, easy. Try and improve the conditions for your horses. Mm -hmm. Also, the normal eating position is down there. Yeah. Okay, not up here. I mean, imagine trying to stretch. You can't get in there. He's got to, he's got to, you got to yeah, either, no, you gotta, you either bring the bowl down or the horse up. Mm -hmm. So you trimmed this yesterday? Yeah, just, just because the hoof was long. Are the edges here? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I just, I just, okay, just, just cut it here. You need a farrier here. Have you got a farrier? Yeah. And James is worried about the state of the horse's hooves. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Just checking that they haven't got hoof rot or something like that because being on a wet surface um, um, and standing in the wet bedding, um, the bedding sticks to the hoof and then it actually like, provides some, promotes moisture there and that can cause infection into the hoof and yeah, it can make it quite painful. Uh, William? Wayne lists the action the owner needs to take. If he doesn't get it right this time, he risks having his ponies confiscated. 
We want to see some. Yeah, yeah but now you're uh, you, 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 with you guys coming in a month's time or week's time or whatever. I don't you what, what do you. What do you reckon? Uh, no, it's up to you, but I don't want you guys to pop in I mean, here when I'm a deer. Can I say. <laughs> can we say a week, two weeks? Two weeks. Okay. Two weeks, two weeks from today, we'll be back and we'll. Uh, yeah. yeah, then you'll see. Thank you. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Mr. Gasser. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. He told us that he is going to bring the flooring up a bit and it's going to be drier. And he also, yeah, he told me about the, 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 the sharp edges. He's going to do something about it. There's a lot of work that can be done and, 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 and should be done um, with regards to the stabling. I mean, uh, obviously, we don't really agree on the stable size, but it's big enough for the horses to turn around in. Bar the one that uh, is a little bit narrow, um, that one he's, he's going to work on. And yeah, he's obviously uh, going to get a farrier in to sort out the hooves that need trimming. I think yeah, we're kind of boiling down to, to, to the last chance at this stage. Cape Town is surrounded by mountains. Most of them are designated national nature reserves and they're full of all sorts of wildlife. That means some calls to the Cape of Good Hope SPCA need a specialist. Kira Joshua is a wildlife inspector. Six years ago, she gained her diploma in wildlife conservation and landed her dream job at the SPCA. Since then, she's learned to deal with all sorts of unpredictable situations. Today, Kira has been called out to a coastal suburb of Cape Town. On the fringes of the city, Wildlife and human residents live side by side. Every so often, they get too close for each other's comfort. It's a call about a porcupine. People found it in the, the garden. Now it seems like the porcupine is stuck between the fence and the, and the you know, it's in the sleuth, really. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try and get it into the box. Well, half past seven uh, this morning, two young ladies came knocking on the door telling me that there was a porcupine uh, in front of the garage door. I found it very strange because it's about 500 meters from the mountain. So uh, he just left in there and he was trapped in a corner. And when I came to look again, he disappeared. And there where we found him lodged between the, um, the fence and, uh, and the ditch, you know. For the animal's well-being, it needs to be moved from here but porcupines weren't designed to be handled by humans. What you basically have to be aware of, that it doesn't actually run into you with the, the quills. Uh, most people, it's just a myth that they shoot the quills out and that's not what actually happens. They just run into the person that, or person or animal that's causing a, a threat to them. What we want to do, we don't want to try and actually handle him, like physically handle him. We don't want to use like a catch bow or anything on him right now. So if we can try and do that as, as calm as possible, we don't actually stress him out. We make him go into the box. He's basically warning us right now. I mean, even though the quills are all up and everything, he's still warning us. The porcupine has around 30,000 quills. They are needle sharp and barbed at the end. So once they're stuck into the skin, they're very painful to remove. One step, one step, one step, one step, Azay. One step, come on. One step in the basket, come on. Come on, in the basket. Come on, come on. No, it's not going to go in. Do you guys have a, a board or something? Like a flat board? It's close, but he won't go in. Kira decides to try a different tactic. What we're doing now, we're just blocking off um, areas so he doesn't see, he just needs to see the, the box as the escape route, basically. Okay, here we go. It's a tense situation. If the porcupine decides to run towards them, those quills could get dangerously close. Finally, he steps into the crate, just as Kira knew he would. 
it's just about having patience. Uh, the trick part was as in where he was positioned in that, um, but it's just about all about having patience. It's not injured or anything, so there's no need for it to be taken in. Most probably it, it came from the, the mountains over here, so we're just going to release it back over there. The wild area where the porcupine probably came from is just a short drive away. The steep hillside above Colt Bay is an ideal habitat for the porcupine. He's not likely to stray into any gardens up here. The reason why we're releasing it over here now, it's close to where we found it. It's natural, you won't find a lot of problems over here for the porcupine. And it's a nice release site over here. It's level and it's a nice area here. been a good morning's work for Kira. Definitely is a nice feeling. Majority of the time it's a really good feeling, releasing it, capturing and releasing. You don't stay at the back. Trainee inspector Wayne Hector is paying a surprise visit to the stables south of Cape Town. He's brought senior inspector James Murphy with him to see whether Murphy agrees that changes need to be made. The owner's not home, but a neighbor decides to get involved. The man seems to be drunk. I know you don't stay here. Please go. I'm gonna call the police. You're interfering with an investigation. If you don't move now, I'm going to call the police. Please go, go. please, now. We're not gonna take any horses out. Please leave now. Go, go, I'm told you, get away. You don't belong here. Intoxicated by the exuberance of his own verbosity. What? Um, hey? These horses don't have much water. Ugh, it's a strong ammonia smell here. You can see there's some toppings there. But, uh, yeah, he's put fresh he's toppings, put toppings on toppings here, but he hasn't taken it out. Yeah, and then he's dry, but underneath it's, it's stinking wet. It's stinking, stinking wet. Okay, okay. It's been almost four weeks since Wayne issued a notice asking the owner to bring the pony's living conditions up to scratch. Oh, it's a cake here. He hasn't done much. He's done with the bedding here, put dried toppings on there, but you can still see that piece of wood dangerously there. We talked about that, and also there's nails and stuff here. Things that could injure the horses easily. He hasn't done anything about that. The urine smell inside the stables is, is, is too strong and it's definitely not, uh, hasn't been cleaned up for a while. You know, he's just messing us around and messing the animals around and then you, you, know, then you need to take action. But uh, we need to build up a, a, a case history in order to, to actually have a, some concrete evidence to actually confiscate the horses and lay charges of animal cruelty. There seem to be only superficial improvements. The SPCA inspectors would much prefer it if the owner would address their concerns voluntarily. But the horse's safety is paramount and their patience is beginning to run out. It's been a month since trainee SPCA inspector Wayne Hector asked the owner of six ponies to improve their living conditions. Wayne and senior inspector James Murphy have not been impressed with how the owner has responded, so they've decided the time has come to take some action. Now we're here at the Weinberg Magistrate's Court to obtain an order from, from the magistrate to remove some horses off the property where the six uh, hackney ponies are, because conditions haven't improved to our satisfaction. You want it in respect of all the horses, six hackney ponies, is that what you're asking for? Yes. We've got the order now to remove the six ponies. We're going to proceed to the property and, uh, and, and remove them. A team has been assembled to meet them at the property. They don't know what sort of reception they'll get. You give this to someone yet, no? yeah, the owner's not there, but with the magistrate's order, they have the authority to begin removing the ponies. A 
final check confirms the filthy state of the stable floor. We actually we saw what we dig the stuff up there. He's just been adding and adding and adding. He never took it out and let it dry out first and then put fresh ones. Slowly, boy. Okay, okay. Slowly, boy. Slowly, boy. It's just un unhygienical and it's unacceptable. So we're taking it out, putting it at the SPCA stables, give him some time to fix up, get nice bedding, get, get all the sharp edges, nails removed, make it more safer for, for, for the horses. The owner might be able to get his ponies back, but now he'll see that the SPCA are serious about the need for improvements. Come on, there we go. Come on, there we go. When he returns, the owner's not happy. He insists he'll make the changes, but Wayne tells him he's had his chance. Now the SPCA inspectors want to see the work completed, and only then will he get the ponies back. All this needs to come out. It's going to mean tons of stuff to come out. And then you put fresh sand, and you, you, you put fresh sand to the, to the level, and you're bedding on top. Sorry, could you ask us to stand outside? Where are you going with the horse now? I can take my horse out. No, you, you can't, can't take your horse out. out. Leave the horse. Oh, oh, come, come on. Leave, Leave the horse. We're not going to take We're not going to take all the horses out to on the willy nilly, okay? We don't want running around you and causing injuries. We are concerned about the horses. No, 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 don't use anything funny. Wait, let's rather wait. Let's rather wait. One at a time, Richard, one at a time. Of course he's upset. He's take, we're taking his horses and he reckons his stables in better condition as some other stables in other areas and stuff. But at the moment we're here and we're trying to improve the, uh, the welfare of animals and that's our main concern. Nothing was done and we had an agreement. He said he's going to work with us, he's going to repair and they didn't do it. Good boy. The ponies will be well cared for at the SPCA. Now they'll wait to see what the owner does next. Well, we've taken the horses um, and uh, given him seven days to contact us to discuss the matter and uh, we'll wait and see what his response is and um, we expect him to get his lawyers onto us and to, to deal with the issue. So, yeah, we'll just have to wait for that and deal with it. The case of the nine pit bulls seized by Inspector Fox Murray and Chief Inspector Andreas Fenter is due in court in a few weeks' time. The dogs are at the SPCA, and the young man who owned them is in the hands of the police. After the animals returned to the shelter, the suspect was placed in custody. He was arrested and a charge of animal cruelty was opened against him. He was then placed in the cells where he's currently awaiting trial. We have had several other leads implicating him as one of the main organizers of fights. So it looks like we've um, come across quite a, quite a big ring. Aggressive animals can't be adopted out, so animal behaviourist Candice de Villiers is assessing the dog's temperament. We have the pit bulls from the raid here that we're going to do some assessments on, behavioural assessment. We would like to try and see if they're going to be aggressive towards other dogs, um, possibility for rehoming. As far as the animals in our shelter goes, it is very difficult to find alternative homes especially when it comes to the pit bulls that has been in fights, that's been trained to fight. The whole socialization of these animals is a huge point of concern. We have to establish whether it will be suitable and safe for those animals to be rehomed into people's care that can and will care for them responsibly. The problem comes in monitoring those adoptions. A kennel assistant tests the dog's reaction to other dogs. It is very frustrating seeing what, what man has done to this breed. They can be fantastic family pets if they've been raised in the right environment and obviously socialized accordingly. But with people utilizing them like this, it's just, it's nauseating. Obviously, euthanasia in, in terms of our, our policy is, is a last re re resort. It will have to be a decision taken not likely. Our mission 
is to prevent cruelty to animals. Our focus are the animals, their surroundings, their future and their welfare. We will not stop. As long as they're busy, we will not stop. As long as animal cruelty takes place, we will be there and we will be in their faces. It's been a stormy winter in Cape Town with frequent torrential rains. An emergency call has come in to the SPCA about a dog in trouble in one of the canals that run through the city. Well, how long has been in there for? SPCA inspector Conchita Milburn and trainee inspector Liesl Pinar have been dispatched okay. to try to get the dog out. We've got a dog in a canal. The water's filling up fast, so we need to get him out of there. ASAP. Conchita volunteers to take to the water. I think this is going to be really deep. Well, we've got a kind of a strong flow going from that side over to this side, and of course, there's a lot of rubble and stuff lying in here, so we don't know what we will be stepping in. Baby! As well as that dog looks like it's stuck to something, so hopefully, not tied. You want the leash now? I'm just worried it's going to take a big drop there. Weasel, it, it's sinking a bit. It's filling up very quickly. Baby, come here. Baby, come here. Come here, watch. It's OK. You never know what the dog's aggression might be. I mean, maybe, maybe he's guarding something there. Uh, you never know. But he might also just be very, very afraid. These urban areas, dogs seek shelter anywhere, but um, I don't know why he would just be sitting there. Maybe it just got too deep all around him and he didn't want it like he's doing now. Maybe he uh, doesn't like the deeper water. But um, a lot of homeless people, they usually also sleep under these bridges, so this might be someone's dog that was waiting for him or something. I, I don't know. Come, come boy. Come. Where, where am I going, Conchita? Come, come. come. I think it's deep there. The dog seems to be in shock and virtually a dead weight. Sir, would you be able to assist us here? A passerby comes to their aid. It's a friendly dog and I'm really glad we got the dog out. As long as you got a good sense of balance, it was right, really. You know, I kind of test your braveness, really. But I'm really, really happy that he worked with us because it could have been quite a harrowing experience. Oh. I don't think he's going to go in there. The dog's safe now. He'll go straight back to the SPCA to recover from his ordeal. At Grassy Park, the dog will get an initial examination from vet Miles Penfold. I'm just basically just going to do just a normal clinical. Just uh, see if there's anything wrong or if she's just wet and cold. So at the moment, I mean, you can feel the hair's quite nice and warm. Um, she's quite scared. Uh, so I'm just trying to not get myself bitten if she get, gets a fright or anything. Here's a good dog. You know, the questions I was wanting to know is like, are they sitting in a stagnant, stagnant pool? Um, if you've got uh, a whole lot of putrid mud and um, rubbish and stuff, like say the dump site there, then if they've got cuts and stuff on them, obviously infection is going to be a lot more of an issue. If it's a clear running water, then probably not so much of an issue than thinking more is the dog cold, given her scenario. Um, at this point in time, really just wanting to make sure that clinically she's okay and probably just fallen in for, for a few hours and, um, and, and going to be okay from there. Now, if you looked at this dog here, this is not a typical dog that I would say has come out of the middle of a township and is really battling for food. This is quite a well looked after dog. Right, okay, he's moving quite nicely on his legs, a little bit that I can't see there. What I'm going to do with this boy is um, just walk him through to the ward. He's walking quite nicely on that. I'll soon pick up any hassles there, as soon as he's chilled out for the day. Come on. Come on, Coco. 
you'll get used to being in the place and then I'll be able to actually get down and pop eight joints and stuff. But uh, definitely the few steps here wasn't showing anything that's making me concerned about ligaments or anything like that. So pretty much just, just had a bit of a cold day in the canal. The dog will go to a nice warm kennel now. They'll try to find his owner, but if no one claims him, then he'll join the 75 other dogs waiting for someone to offer them a home. It's been two weeks since six hackney ponies were confiscated by the SPCA because their living conditions were unhealthy and unsafe. Today, they're being visited by the farrier and his assistant at the SPCA in Grassy Park. What we're doing is just trimming the feet a lot shorter because they've been confiscated and the feet have been left very long. And um, we're just trying to make them more comfortable. Every four to five weeks, we trim horses' feet. It's not the shoe that the, makes the horse sound, it's the foot growth, actually. You know, it's a lot like your nail. When your nail grows, you get, it gets uncomfortable and you want to cut it. Now, it's the same for a horse, and he can't do that. So you need to do your horse every four to five weeks. It's just a basic necessity for a horse. The good news is that the confiscation seems to have prompted some action. They won't fight you. The owner of the ponies has finally made significant improvements to his stables. Trainee inspector Wayne Hector has been back twice to check on progress. The conditions is much better there for the horses to go into. Um, we've done a lot of work on the stabling. They've decided he can have his ponies back, as long as he keeps working on the stables. Still ongoing thing, it's never a closed case. So. Still ongoing monitoring, educating, and just working with the owner to get the, keep the conditions up and, yeah, and acceptable. Okay. You can see here, yeah, this was a, this used to be a steel gate, yeah, makeshift steel gate, with tied with wires and oh, it was hanging, and you didn't even know which way it swings. But now he's put, he's put up a new, a, a new door here, yeah, makes it. And also, yeah, he's, he's put some more savings here. You can see it's totally dry. If you can, as you can see, it's nice and clean. And all the nails and stuff, he's, he's, he's removed most of the nails. Wayne will monitor the stables and make sure the improvements continue. But he's happy his message has got through. I think this is, this is better off, this is much better off for the horses and that's more acceptable. For me, it's a big improvement. I'm, I'm satisfied with conditions and you didn't get the contractors to come in and do a major renovation, but he did what he could in his own capacity and it's, it, that's more, that's for me, that means a lot that he cares for his horses and he, he wants to improve it. We just need to keep it this way. That's, that's the only thing that we need to do. We need to make sure that it's kept this way. Wayne's handling of the pony case is a big step forward in his journey towards qualification as an inspector, but he still has a lot to learn. Wildlife inspector Kira Joshua is on her way to Sunrise Beach, east of Cape Town, and she's asked Wayne to give her a hand. Kira's received a report of an injured seal this will be a chance for Wayne to pick up some of Kira's techniques for handling wildlife. You can see it there, it's just close to the water. What? A clay, right. clay ink. The man who spotted the seal guides them across the beach. Oh, it's thin. It's a Cape fur seal with its thick fur pelt. There are about two million of these seals living off the coast of South Africa and Namibia there's definitely something wrong with this one. It's very weak. Normally, I mean, they would be like charging at us. If it was healthy, the seal would be basically charging at us. You can see, I mean, it's, it's pretty thin for this age as well. So we're going to take the seal in now and have a treat and see what we can do. In this emaciated condition, the seal wouldn't survive long. It urgently needs to get fluids inside it, and then they'll try to find out whether there's something causing the weight loss. And you see why the box is better, because there's like less actual handling on the seal. On the seal, yeah. Yeah, so there's like less stress. Ooh. 
we're taking the seal now to the SPCA. We're going to weigh it, check the temperature, and the vet will have a, a look at the seal, and we'll make a decision from there. It's a short drive back to the SPCA HQ at Grassy Park. But for any wild animal, this kind of handling is highly stressful. Thankfully, the seal is still holding on when Kira and Wayne bring it in to vet Miles Penfold. I mean, if we just have a look at him straight here, he's just skin and bones. Um, so your first impression is he's like, he obviously hasn't been eating. Kira's job now is to provide expert assistance to Dr. Penfold. They can whip back at any time and they can cause quite a nasty bite. So and that's why I just need to have a firm grip on, on the seal at the moment. With any wildlife, they are going to get stressed, but it's part of it. You are going to need to handle them if you want to, to treat them. Oh, the case gums and everything like that. Clinically, when you have a look at him here, he's just really thin. There's no breaks, there's nothing else on that. His breathing is pretty good. Um, we're not picking up any, any coughs or any kind of other signs of infection that we're concerned about. So I'm really happy with him. His color's good. Uh, overall, looking pretty healthy, just very, very, very thin. He just needs food. We'll, we'll be able to see sort of how he responds with, with, with some fish. The seal needs to be somewhere he can swim and have his food intake monitored. That means another journey, this time to the Marine Research Centre at Sea Point. It's a longer drive than the last one, but they hope he'll be able to make it. Wildlife inspector Kira Joshua has arrived at the Marine Research Centre with the seal she rescued from Sunrise Beach. There they hope he'll begin to put on some weight. Basically, um, you can see he's quite emaciated. So we're just going to basically feed him up. Um, so what we're going to do now, I'm going to give him just about four fish. SPCA vet Miles Penfold prescribed some drugs to help with the seal's recovery. Everything I'm going to put into the fish right now, it's, I'm going to give it about a quarter a Simlock. Um, I'm also going to give it Valium. Valium has a dual purpose where it will serve as an appetite stimulant as well as to, to calm the animal down. Want? Yes, now? Mm -hmm. He won't take it now. I'm going to leave it here and see what he does by himself. I think right now, I mean, obviously, he's just he's stressed out from the transport and everything like that. What I'm going to try now is just I'm going to leave the fish here with him. Obviously, just observe up from that side. Because if we can avoid force feeding, then, then that would be obviously better because then there's less handling and less handling would mean less stress. Left alone, the seal finally shows some sign of interest in the fish. He's eating nicely here, so we're going to come back tomorrow morning again. Um, we'll put some more meds in, in the fish. We'll open this up and then um, we'll see how, how nicely he'll swim. And he'll probably take fish more easily in the water as well. It's a good start, but the seal has a long way to go before he gets up to a healthy weight. The next few days are going to be critical. <laughs> I don't know how anyone can, can live like this. Basically what you're standing on is feces that's been stepped in. A month after Chief Inspector Andreas Fenter and Inspector Fox Murray uncovered evidence of organized dog fighting, the owner of the dogs is awaiting trial on charges of animal cruelty. He signed all his animals over to the SPCA. The pit bulls are still being carefully assessed to see whether it's safe to place them in new homes. Oh, Thankfully, the other animals that were seized at the same time have already been adopted. The ginger kitten is settling in well to Katie Briel's home and is making friends with Katie's daughters, Sophia and Gita, and their older cat, Black Beauty. The 
first day or two, they were very suspicious of each other, and Lulu didn't seem to know how to play very much. She was very loving from as soon as she arrived and liked interacting with people a lot, but didn't know quite how to interact with Black Beauty and wasn't very playful. Black Beauty was incredibly playful, and after about two days, they had found each other and started to play a lot, and now they never stop. She's a bit like a dog because she runs around and chases her tail. <laughs> very playful and cuddly and <laughs> quite naughty sometimes. The other day she was circling the bath water very, very curiously and then after we got out of the bath she just couldn't resist anymore and leaned too far in and fell in the bath. When the girls said they wanted a new kitten, Katie knew exactly where to go. Well, I support what the SBCA does. I think they do an incredible job of taking care of animals and finding homes for them. And our feeling was that if we were going to get an animal, we should get an animal that needed a home and support them. Wildlife inspector Kira Joshua is back at the Marine Research Center to check on the seal she rescued yesterday. Today, she's brought new trainee inspector Liesl Pinar with her, and they're in for a pleasant surprise. Looking good. The seal that had been at death's door yesterday has transformed overnight with the help of some fish and the drugs the SPCA vet prescribed. So when do you know if he's ready for release? Well, when he's picked up a nice substantial amount of weight, we don't want to keep him longer than is necessary. Mm -hmm. But at least needs to be um, fit. Every seal is different. Um, it could be that I mean, the medication like help him out a lot. <laughs> the seal's ribs are still clearly visible, and he still needs to take in a lot more food. They'll keep a close eye on him here at the research centre, but they hope it won't be too long before he's ready to go back into the sea. Him eating the fish in the pool is a good sign. It's quite awesome watching them um, swim in there, especially like after they, they eat and then they go in their backs and they rub their tummy and they rub their heads. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> It's early morning in Cape Town, South Africa. Andries Fenter, Chief Inspector of the Cape of Good Hope Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, has received a call for help from an animal welfare organization in the town of Caledon, 80 miles to the east. There's a lady who's got a, about 100, 150 odd cats and we've been officially asked to investigate and go and um, remove the animals. Fenter is taking three inspectors with him. They've got a difficult job ahead of them. It, it's not, not a normal day at all. I'm expecting the worst. I have advised our hospital and our kennels that they need to expect the worst as well. It's alleged that, that she's been hoarding for, for quite a few years and they've just been breeding and breeding in, inside her home. I don't expect this to be a one hour job. From everything he's heard, it sounds like the woman in Caledon has had a psychological problem with hoarding animals. Hoarding is a proven syndrome where people get to a stage of just collecting animals. All they do is they collect animals, collect animals, and they don't realize and they don't see the um, inbreeding that's taking place. They don't see the disease spreading. I don't know if they don't see it or don't want to see it, but it, it, it just becomes a whole dirty, messy situation. Spread of disease and inbreeding is our main, main concern in situations like this. It, it just uh, goes out of control. It, it starts becoming a health hazard to the neighbors and to the community's animals. It takes two hours for Fenter, Senior Inspector James Murphy, and Inspectors Jacques Buis and Liesel Pinar to reach their destination. It's a substantial old property on the edge of town. Gloves, spray yourself down before and after. 
We're taking precautions in terms of uh, disease spreading, so we're spraying ourselves down, just preventing ourselves from, from being in, infected or carrying the, the disease out. I need you to record what pictures you're taking, what pictures we, I'm taking. The court order allows me to enter the premises without the consent of the owner and to seize any animals that I deem necessary to seize. Already, Pinar has made a grim discovery. Ah. Eh. Okay. No, this cat died. Uh, we've got a dead cat here. It's probably been dead for a while because its head is like totally decomposed. Oh. Why is this cat dead? Is it, and I mean, if it was her cat and she was looking after them, she's kind of been through the yard, she would have known that this cat was here. If it died due to her ne neglect and not treating it, it's cause for serious concern. The smell is really bad. You can smell it from there. What, the smell inside? Yeah. It's a belief. There's no response to their knocking. It seems no one's home. With the dead cat outside and the appalling smell coming from inside, Fenter decides they need to get into the house without delay. Oh, the smell is horrible. Whoa. The roof's precarious, but Fenter spotted an open window. I'm going to climb through the window and I'm going to come down and see if I can't open a door. Okay. Okay, the window is open, but it's really bad. Expect the worst, eh? I'm not getting bitten today. I hope these dogs would accept me in the best of faith. Hello. The dogs are running around, obviously a bit freaked out by Andres being upstairs. Hey, hey. Don't be nasty. Murphy and Buiz try to distract the dogs as Fenta comes down through the house. Come on, big boy. When Fenta opens up the windows, one of the dogs makes a dash for it. Neighbours have begun to gather, curious to find out exactly That's what's fine. been going on in the house. I just want to put this one in here. They may not need to seize the dogs, as they seem healthy but they'll be kept safely out of the way while the inspectors begin the work of removing the cats. They've come prepared. Cats feel safer confined in an in a enclosed dark area than in open space. So instead of putting them in open cages that they can see everyone outside when they come out, this is less stress for them. OK, we're taking room for room. We need to clear this room. Inside, the cats are at first nowhere to be seen. But there are some surprises. Oh, no. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 chicken heads in the microwave oven. With brains and all. Oh, no, some more that she's fed to the cats. As they move through the house, photographic evidence of the conditions is recorded for presentation to the court. Some of them are quite horrific. Cat feces on the floor. This is the cause of the, of the smell in there, is, is, is the cat feces and the cat urine. Chicken heads on, on a plate that she's cooking in the microwave. Also the back room there it goes into the underground cellar and there's like really some yucky stuff there. Quite gross. Okay, here's a cat, two cats. And there it comes. Careful, careful. Gradually, the cats begin to emerge from their hiding places. Now the tough work of catching them begins. There are 93 societies for the prevention of cruelty to animals in South Africa. The Cape of Good Hope SPCA has 10 inspectors, covering an area of 9,000 square miles. They receive over 6,000 calls every year reports of cruelty and pleas for help. Most of them come through to Alex Lorimer in control and dispatch at the SPCA headquarters at Grassy Park. Thank you very much for calling it in. Let me get our inspector on his way. 
Oscar, Oscar, go for control. This one, Alex is assigning to Inspector Nelson Sawati. We've got a case for you in West Bank. It's a lady that's got a dog that has been thrown with oil and oil. It's an urgent need of medical attention. We need to go there and just assist the lady. Nelson has been working at the SPCA since 1972. He started out as an animal care assistant before qualifying as an inspector 15 years ago. My dog is in a very bad condition. When did this happen? On Sunday. Come stroller. On Sunday. Where was she when this happened? Come she stroller. usually walks around mm. nearby the house, you see. You have to admit it uh, to hospital. I pray to God they can save this animal. Oh. She's very faithful. Just, just walk with us in case, I mean, just to keep her comfortable. Do you know who did this? Yes, it's the people of this house. They burnt her with rice water. Did you see it happen, Ma? Or... No, this child here crossed the road saw it and he shouted, Oma, Oma, he brantler, Oma, so on. The dog has already been suffering for two days. Nelson's first priority is to get her to the hospital for emergency treatment. Once he knows the dog is safe, he can turn his attention to finding out exactly how she came to be so horrifically scolded. We'll take all the particulars so yes. that we can get in touch with you. Ma, all right, I'll take her to hospital. We've got your contact number, we'll con contact you. Yes. But further on, yes. with the doctor's report and all that, yes. we're going to have to come back to you because we may need to uh, make a court case on this. That this is, is animal cruelty. This concerns me very much because if we have enough evidence, we can go as far as the court case because a person um, has to be prosecuted under the Animal Protection Act, but we have to prove that. And also with the vet, the vet's report will assist us in the court case. Here we go, here we go. Got a cat in that room, it's a flippin' big one. Broke that, that box, so isn't it? SPCA Chief Inspector Andre Sventer and his team of inspectors are still at the house in Caledon, east of Cape Town, where they've been told a woman is keeping over a hundred cats. So far, there's been no sign of the owner, but they've got into the house and started searching for the cats. They're semi-wild and take some catching. One, two, three, go. We caught five cats so far, as you can see tearing our gloves apart. They're, they're all feral in there. Ah! It's a big bit me right through the glove. Ah! Can't believe he missed me. After an hour, they're up to 15 cats. There's still a lot of work to do. He was playing a trick with us. As we caught him the first time, he get his claws through here. I don't know why or how. And he just break the cage. Go, Kitty. Wild Tom, separate cage. It's hot, it's humid, it's wooden floors, it stinks. When a carpet starts disintegrating from urine and feces, you know there's a problem. Take him straight to the van. Living in such unhealthy conditions has had a terrible effect on many of the cats. Their eyes are gungy, they've got breathing problems, um, tails are missing, um, they, they're generally just not healthy. Um, it, it's what I expected. Close. Ah. Okay. I don't understand how, how a person gets to a stage like this where you don't smell it, you don't see it, you don't realise what's, what's going on. I have empathy for, I think, there's serious mental problems here, but I've got no, no sympathy for them. Most of them have a discharge in their eyes. This wild one that just came in, it looks as though his whole eye is missing. I can't even describe this cat. This cat is very, very sick, pus coming out of the eyes. And if this one's like that, all of them will eventually have gotten like that if we haven't interfered. Chief Inspector Fenter and Inspector Jacques Buys have discovered more cats that haven't survived living here. Okay, Andres, uh, get this one underneath the floor. 
where he took that out. And he has two more cats that we find dead on the floor. Can't believe that you can live, live with that in your kitchen. And these cats as well was, was there. This is just one of them. The, the dead animals smell better than the live ones. Hi, ma'am. Through the, through, through the top window. Now there's a new surprise. Fenters opened a door yes, and discovered an elderly woman in her sitting room. She's equally surprised to find Fenter in her house. Okay, I've got a court order today to remove all your cats. If you want to argue... The woman tells him she lives here with her daughter. This is cruelty to animals. It's not. It's never been. She says they used to have many more cats, but her daughter has taken most of them to neighbouring farms. To These cats are suffering. They, they, they're diseased. OK, so if you want to argue with me, we can do that at the police station. Well, there's a lot of issues going on here. Um, the people, for one, need help. But at this stage, uh, our, our concern is the cats and the conditions in which they're living. It's disgusting and it's unhygienic for the cats. It's unhygienic for the people. You know, we need to get these cats out of here. I understand that you don't need this, but I need to search this, this room before you have set yourself. Ma'am, then I will have to have you removed by the police. Allowing animals to just die and leave them there without realizing that, that there's cats missing. The disease, the eyes, the, the coughing, the sneezing. This has been going on for years. It's, it's just not right. The daughter has returned home. Fenter can see no reason why she has allowed this neglect to go on. He's decided this should be treated as a case of animal cruelty, and the woman will have to appear before a court. We will be laying criminal charges against you for the cats as well as for the bodies we found in the house. They've been at the house for over four hours by the time they are ready to return to Cape Town. They've seized 20 cats and found the remains of eight more. They'll all go back to the SPCA for examination by a vet. The hospital is on standby, so we're taking them back to the hospital at the moment. From there, I'll get vet report on, on, on each cat or, if necessary, a post-mortem report. I will then compile a docket, I'll submit it to the police station and open charges of cruelty. Come, baby. Oh. Inspector Nelson Sawati has arrived at the SPCA with stroller. The dog scolded when neighbours allegedly threw boiling water over her. Veterinarian George Birch has come out to take a look at stroller straight away. I will have to shave that and clean all that out. Because everything, this is going to die. Once you have a big wound here, you can't really, you can't really fi uh, fix it because it's difficult to get all the skin back. So mm. it all depends how much di actually dies off. Burns can cause irreparable damage. They won't know how serious Stroller's problems are until the fur has been removed. She's taken through to surgery. Well, we're just going to give some anesthetic to this dog now. It's for us to shave and see how bad the damage is underneath there. We need to shave all that air off, and this obviously is very painful, this whole area. Boiling fluid was thrown over this dog. This should actually shock me, but you see terrible things, actually. With strollers safely sedated, the furs carefully shaved away. And Dr. Birch is given cause for some optimism. It's actually looking much better than I uh, thought it would be. You can see here yeah, there is a line that goes there. I thought more skin would be dead. If this whole area would die off, then we would have a hell of a time trying to get the skin to cover that again. So I think what we're going to do now is just going to clean this and then apply some local um, ointment and then just see how we progress in the next couple of days. Stroller will take time to recover from her injuries here in the SPCA hospital. Next, Nelson will try to find out who was responsible for causing her such harm. Meanwhile, Chief Inspector Andries Fenter, Senior Inspector James Murphy, and Inspectors Jacques Buis and Liesel Pinot have arrived back in Cape Town with the cats they seized in Caledon. The cats are in a pitiful condition. Most of the cats are thin, scruffy, uh, sneezing, very wild, uh, eyes popping, diarrhea, tails cut off. 
even veterinarian Miles Penfold is shocked by such neglect, especially as terrible illnesses like these are easily preventable. Both eyes are, 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 are full of pus. I mean, this cat is probably the worst case of snuffles that I've seen. Most likely, that's a, it's a viral condition that starts off and then damages the upper respiratory system in the cat, and um, you can prevent it by vaccinating. This is a terminal case. This cat's left to its own will probably have died in, in the next couple of days. And I've never seen a case of snuffles this bad, and, and we see a lot of a lot of snuffles. You can see he's a, he's a feral cat, and, and he's got hardly any any strength left in him. It doesn't really get much worse than this. You know, this would be like probably one of the most, more extreme cases of suffering that we'll get to see. I think there are fates worse than death and in, in this case will actually be a, a mercy to let this cat go. Very tired. Quite a hectic day, long day. Now it's the follow up that, that comes sorting out the animals. This is another one of the cats that has come through. Um, this eye is completely gone, so this cat is completely blind. Okay, it's also quite pale. There's a good chance that a lot of these cats have got feline leukemia or feline AIDS over and above snuffles. Now a cat like this, quality of life is, is next to nothing. Uh, unfortunately for this guy here, um, it's, it's really going to be, be a case of putting him to sleep. That's going to be the kindest thing that we can actually do in this situation. Fenter knows that some suffering has been spared and criminal charges will be pursued. Some small consolation for the tragedy he's witnessed today. I just feel sick to my stomach but that's all I can describe it's 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 not lacquer it's all I want to do is go home and just see my own animals you can see one kennel two dogs in the Parkwood suburb of Cape Town, Senior Inspector James Murphy is assisting Inspector Fox Murray with a case he's been pursuing for three months. Filthy yard, even though instructions were given to clean up the yard. Fox has issued notices requiring the owners to improve the living conditions of three dogs. He's seen few changes, and now he's concerned that the dogs are dangerously thin. Hello, puppy. The dogs are all extremely emaciated. Hey, come on, come on. Extremely thin, totally neglected, especially since we've already had a case with this guy for the conditions of the dog. Yeah, this one's thin, you can feel the ribs. Okay, this is a, what, five month old puppy. Um, it's ribs, are, you can actually stick the fingers into the ribs. It's so thin, it's possible the dog has got some worms. Condition is not acceptable, um, and for this guy to have left it like this and not heeded the warnings that were issued, um, it's getting worse. So we've got to do something. Let's see if you can take. This one's the same, also ribby. Then you can see the pelvis. Watch the leg. Watch the leg. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Here we go. Okay. So I've been taken into the custody of the society and uh, uh, checked by the vet. A report is written up regarding their condition. Dogs are then treated and looked after and the owner has seven days to contact us, failing which the dogs become our property. There you go. There we go. The final dogs are poodle mix. They'll all go back to the SPCA hospital for assessment. It's very difficult when you sort of have dealt with people and you've explained the situation and they've kind of, you know, said that they're going to make a difference and things are going to improve and then you come and check and, you know, it looks like the guy's trying and then two, three months down the line you come back and it's sort of worse than what it was in the beginning so it is very frustrating definitely but hopefully now we'll either keep the dogs and try to find them a good home or the owner will come forward and you know perhaps start to make a real improvement in their lives Park, Murphy and Murray start taking the dogs through for medical examinations. But the poodle mix has other ideas. Come, we gotta run away. The dog ran out before I could grab him. Where is he now? 
This is not good. Where is he? Ah, oh, come on, dog. Go chase him back, Dex! Okay, Fox. Make a line. Uh-oh. Come on, dog. Come on, boy. Yeah. We must close this gate, yeah. He's scared, so I think he'll bite if you grab him. Get, get, get. Uh, Fox, we're going to try and corner him. Okay, pick him up, he's exhausted. He's out of breath, and so are the inspectors. But there's no harm done from his little adventure. Yeah, let's go. Right. When he's calmed down a bit, he'll join the queue to be examined by vet Miles Penfold. You can feel the, the vertebra in the neck. Um, so this gives us an indication of how much meter they got on them, how emaciated are they. Um, this one here is quite, quite thin, but the actual muscles over the lumbar area here um, are still rounded. The younger dog is in even worse shape. Okay, straight away looking at this pup, you can see it's thin, it's emaciated, and that's just pretty extreme malnourishment. Um, if we look around the tail, you have a lift up the tail, everything's sunken in here, there's just absolutely no fat reserves left on this, this one. If we feel down onto the transverse processes of the vertebra, uh, the muscle here is, it's, it's denting in like this, so, so this dog really has not had enough food. This is not acceptable. I would definitely say that um, if, you know, if this is an owned animal, then this is neglect. If Even if he contacts them, it's very unlikely the owner will be getting these dogs back. At the Cape of Good Hope SPCA in Grassy Park, Cape Town, Inspector Nelson Sawati is paying a visit to the dog that had boiling water thrown over her. Stroller's been here for five days now, and she's making good progress. Hello, Stroller. How are you now? You're a good girl. Yes. We're going to tell mommy that you're getting better, eh? Now you're in theater hood. She looks very much better and uh, she's very friendly. It seems as if she knows that she is being saved. Now Nelson wants to question the neighbors said to have caused the injuries. Just, I'll speak to you just now. Now we're going to the people uh, who allegedly uh, bent stroller. We'll find out um, what their side of the story is. Okay, this lady reports that on this particular day she cooked rice. And then um, when she rinsed her rice, um, the uh, rice water, you know, she threw um, out and she didn't see that um, there was a dog. Actually, Stroller came running across, and uh, you know, that is how uh, Stroller uh, got bent. But I feel in the meantime, seeing that it wasn't intentional, I'll just write them a warning. I've no pin of Beko into animal cruelty. Nelson accepts this was probably an accident, but he wants them to know if anything similar happens again, they could be in trouble. For now, the most important thing is to get Stroller better and back with her owner. Jeez. Last time on Animal Cop South Africa. Oh, this place is filthy. Oh my goodness. Come look here, boss. Well, back of the door is absolutely covered in blood. You can only imagine that there were animals ripping each other apart. I'm removing all the animals on this property. Chief Inspector Andries Fenter and Inspector Fox Murray uncovered a suspected pit bull fighting operation. This is a serious offence in terms of the Animal Protection Act. All the animals were seized and the owner was charged with animal cruelty. He's been spending some time in Poldsmore Prison. And today, he'll answer the charges against him. I will proceed with the court's leave now to put the charges to the accused. You will unlawfully, intentionally or negligently ill-treated... It's an open court session, and the public gallery is packed with onlookers. You unlawfully and intentionally possessed, kept, bred and or had under your control eight pit bull dogs for the purpose of fighting any other animal. 
Do you understand the charge? What do you plead guilty to? The man has pleaded guilty on all counts. He admits that he's guilty of unnecessarily starving eight pit bull dogs, two cats and one cocktail. He admits that he raised and bred eight pit bull dogs for the purpose of organizing dog fights. And for this reason, he decided to hide the dogs when the SPCA came to do an inspection at his place of residence. The accused is convicted of all the offenses charged with. The outcome is he's um, fined with 5,000 rand. Um, that fine is suspended for five years. Um, he is further ordered to um, do 1,000 hours community services at, our, at the SPCA in Cape Town. He is uh, further ordered he's not allowed to own any animals for 15 years. Um, and he is to pay the SPCA um, 5,000 rand with immediate effect. I think it's a serious message to, to the public out there that animal cruelty will be taken seriously and we will be vigilant in taking it through to, to court to make sure that we get a conviction. In the course of this investigation, Fenter has also uncovered evidence that he hopes will lead to further arrests before long. The three emaciated dogs rescued from a house in Parkwood have been at the SPCA for just over two weeks now, and they've all been putting on weight. You bite the dog just to get rid of the fleas and to protect the dog skin, then the hair can grow much easier. Animal care assistants Tembi Nomkala and Tarin Boys have been helping the dogs overcome the neglect that they'd suffered. Daily baths are a key part of the routine. The shampoo we're using it kills fleas and ticks and it gives him a nice, clean feeling. And you must be always careful that the shampoo doesn't go in the dog's eyes. They've named the older female dog Sparky. Yes, that's right. On the behavior side, she's a gentle and quiet dog. She stands a chance of getting a, a lovely home. We take her out to try it. Look at that house. Ah. She feels clean for the first time mm. in ages. Happy and feeling good. <laughs> Animal behaviorist Candice de Villiers is going to begin the process of assessing the dog's suitability for adoption, starting with the poodle mix that proved such a lively customer when he first arrived at the SPCA. They've named him Maxi. We walk them through the actions that would be towards the cats. If they're going to show any aggression, then we can advise people, dogs not very good with cats. All the dogs go through this behavioral assessment. How did he walk on his lead? Yeah, he walked fine. Did he walk yeah, fine? Yeah, he was fine. Okay. And the next thing we're going to do is stroking the dog, to see how, what his capacity is of accepting us stroking him. He's uncertain, he, he's wanting to come a little bit closer. He's enjoying it, but some dogs you just stroke them once and they launch themselves up into your face. So we just want to see what measure they can cope with um, just giving them a gentle stroke. Are they very active or not? That's a safe hug. If a child had to come up and give the dog a hug, if, would the dog be comfortable, yes or not? If he wasn't comfortable, you could see he just freezes because he's uncertain. He wouldn't give it to a two-year-old child if he's going to barge the child over or something like that, or not appreciate it. We're just going to check their teeth. Some dogs are not very comfortable with that, um, obviously because you're making them do something that they don't enjoy or that they don't want you to do. We often see it with dogs that have, have really never had experiences with, with children or humans playing with them. Yard dogs, for instance, they, um, they've never really, they, the thing that has kept them busy has been digging or chewing a stone or something like that. Never ever toys been given to them. If he's also uncertain as to what is expected of him, he doesn't quite know what, might ne has never have probably played with toys or anything like that. We'll do the food bowl next. It will assist us to obviously also know that if, if the dog is resource guarding, food aggressive, that children or humans should be aware of that if they adopt them. Rub a hand. That's obviously just to prevent the handler from being get bitten.
He's not bothered. He's not too happy about it, but that could also be due to his, him just being very nervous. It's just to see what the dog's um, level of uh, noise phobic is. Um, does he recover quickly? Does he not recover quickly? He got a huge fright, but he did recover quite easily. We do these assessments so that we can prevent people from returning the dogs to us saying, this dog bit my child, or um, this dog's not getting along with my cats, or this dog's not getting along with the rest of the family, or doesn't like the you know, people touching it and stuff like that. Maxie's shy, but he's looking like an excellent candidate for a new home with someone who'll care for him properly. He would be good with children. He's very sweet, very gentle dog. Obviously, he needs some confidence building. Um, which we would hopefully work on here at the SPCA, see how he copes in the kennel environment with our volunteers walking him and handling him and managing him. Um, if he comes out of his shell, then, then that's fantastic. We we'll prepare him for going to his new home, hopefully. It's early morning and Inspector Conchita Milburn is heading south. She's assembled a team from the SPCA's mobile clinic, and along with some of her fellow inspectors, they're on their way to one of Cape Town's poorest communities to try and improve the lives of the animals there. Today we're going out to an informal settlement um, called Egoli. As a team for the SBCA with different departments, so we've got hospital included and education, just to deworm the animals on site, um, to dip the animals and to take in animals for treatment and sterilization. Around 1,700 people live in this community. Many of them are unemployed, so subsidized medical care for their animals from organizations like the SPCA is invaluable. It's immediately clear that there are a lot of dogs. The first challenge is to find out who owns them. And the only way to do that is on foot. OK, Zola. Whenever you see animals and people around, you just start saying, is this your dog? Try to find out who the owner is. And then talk to them and see if you can help in any way. Senior Inspector Kira Joshua is keen to get started. And educating the public is her utmost priority. The thing is you want to work with the people as well. I mean, we're only going to confiscate if absolutely necessary. They're just going to learn that, you know, SPCA just comes in and takes. And that's not the kind of impression that we want to give the people. We want to have the impression that, you know what, we are fair and understanding, but our main concern would be the, the animals and how to educate people. Kira quickly spots a dog with a problem. The thing is, you, we have this, what it seems to be a mange, and it's a mite that gets underneath the skin, yeah. right? So that's what causes the, the hair loss in that. But the thing is, I mean, the SPCA is right down the road over here, uh, in Grassy Park. Uh, but they charge a lot of money there. No, so if you don't have the money, and the thing is, we're here to help people that don't have money. So we'll never ever turn anybody away. On the other side of the settlement, Conchita is dealing with an even more serious case of mange. Do you ever clean up this area? Do you ever clean this area up? You pick up the, the feces. This isn't hygienic living conditions for the animal. It's going to carry on getting eye infections. It's going to carry on picking up disease. Are you going to surrender your dog? We're going to take your dog. I've got no other option then. Conchita persuades her they only want to help the dog. It's appalling. I mean, the dog has mange on its head. It's got open skin. It's getting fly bites. And it's better that the dog gets taken out of this. This area needs a lot of work. You can have nothing, but you can still have, you can still be proud and you can still have, you can still raise your living conditions, keep things clean, keep them tidy. The owner signs over the dog in the knowledge that due to the severity of the condition, the kindest option now is to put her to sleep. They've left it too late. So they've basically determined the fate of the dog themselves. 
definitely is disheartening because I mean you come into a place where people are living the way they're living right now and then you know trying to tell them about what's best for the animals and that and you look at the condition which people are living in as well. Thankfully, for some animals, it's not too late. One of the first dogs who will be taken back to the SPCA is Tiger. This is where, where we found Tiger. Um, basically, there's no shelter, there's no drinkable water, food's been thrown on the ground, there's actually intestines from an animal left behind. There's a thick chain indicative that Tiger does get tied up. Um, we did leave him a warning regarding the shelter, the hygiene, um, tying the dog up, fresh water. So he's agreed to improve the situation. He's also given permission to sterilize. So we'll be back on Friday to do a recheck and take it from there. He's got loads of work to do there if he wants his dog back. He's got to clean it up big time. News has spread of the SPCA's visit and dogs start to appear from every nook and cranny. By mid-morning, a queue has formed at the mobile clinic. The mobile clinic was great. We dewormed about 20 animals and dipped 44 animals. Sterilizations, we've managed to bring in 16. I mean, that's what we want to do, is raise the living conditions for the animals. But I think as a, a joint initiative, it's good, because the social workers are at it too. So the community and the animal welfare goes hand in hand. It's been a productive day, but education never stops, and the team will be back soon to check on things. Malcolm Rhodes is a volunteer at the SPCA. He's been taking a special interest in the three dogs rescued in an emaciated condition in Parkwood. They've been here for six weeks now and have all put on weight. Malcolm's been trying to teach good manners to the two older dogs, Maxie and Sparky. We try to train them so that when somebody comes along specifically to adopt them or when they're at home that they don't jump up because, you know, you can get covered in mud. No dogs. Maxie's had a smart new haircut and he's a fast learner. Maxie was a lot more nervous when I first uh, worked with him and it was very difficult to get a leash on. Obviously now, because he's been walked quite a few times and he's got used to the people in the kennels, he's a far happier dog than he was previously. What we try to do now is to get the dogs to walk properly on a leash. If you keep reinforcing good behavior by feeding the dog and giving him treats, then it builds confidence. The whole technique is to reward good behavior and ignore bad behavior. Good. The very first time that I walked him, he was so nervous, even if I accidentally scuffed my shoe along the ground, he would start like this, the tail would go between the legs, and it clearly he was lacking confidence. So he's far more confident now. It's a very nice dog, it's got a lovely temperament, it's got a lovely nature, and I'm pretty certain that with the right home, it would really make a, a fantastic dog to adopt. What are you scared about? Hey, come, come, here we go, here we go. <laughs> Malcolm's also been working hard to gain Sparky's trust. That's a good girl, right? Oh. Wherever she was, wherever she was previously brought up, people obviously had treated her not as well as what we would like. So she's still extremely nervous. She's uh, taken to me a little bit. She's a little bit more confident, but certainly there's something that's still making her nervous. But at the moment, she needs a lot more confidence before they can put her in the uh, kennels up for adoption. Good girl. There we are, that's good. What we do here is we work mainly with the dogs that are up for adoption. And what we try to do is to make them more adoptable. Good, good. I've retired, so I have a lot of time on my hands now. So I come here three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Friday mornings. And why I've come to the SPCA is because I like animals, and the work that they do here is very important. So it's an opportunity for me to uh, combine an interest in animals and a wish to do something for the community and for the animal community, as well as to uh, keep myself active. Let's go. With the help of volunteers like Malcolm, Maxi and Sparky should soon be starting a new life in a new home. Ooh. 
48 hours ago, Conchita and a team from the SPCA mobile clinic traveled to a settlement to try and improve the lives of the community's animals. So today we're back in Igoli. We're just returning animals that were sterilized with us. The environment that one dog was living in was of particular concern. So she was left with no other option than to confiscate him until she saw significant improvements. Basically what we saw here the other day was really unhygienic. Um, unacceptable conditions. So in two days, Jerome's um, basically made a, a big effort and there's a big difference. He's boarded the floor, um, he's cleaned up, and it's more spacious, he's extended. Oh, it's just a remarkable improvement, really. So this is a work in progress. Jerome's agreed still to put shelter, erect shelter. So this is just accommodation for the evening, and if the weather is bad, Tiger sleeps inside with Jerome's. Tiger's owner has worked hard, and Conchita has no reservations about returning him. We will be back to check on the shelter, how things are going. No, he's definitely happy to be home and happy to be with his dad, for sure. It's been three weeks since Inspector Nelson Sawati rushed a dog to the hospital after she'd had boiling water thrown over her. Now Stroller's ready to go home. Stroller has fully recovered. Now it is time for Stroller to come home. She has been doing very well in hospital and we decided that she comes home. She has been missing the owner also. That is why we're bringing Stroller home. Okay. Hello, Mom. Stroller. Stroller is coming oh, home come today. On, baby. Thank you. Victor, thank you. Yeah, Strola is thank doing you. very well. Oh, she yes, looks can, so good. You can see the uh, Ben wound is... Oh, the, she's so beautiful. The Ben wound is completely healed. Thank you, Inspector. Yeah, oh, Strola she's looking so beautiful. She's I'm so girl. grateful for what you people have done for her. <laughs> really. Come to mommy. She's lively. She's got that spark in her again and barking. I'm happy for that. Yes, mommy loves you. She's very, very well, really. They've done a very good job with her. We believe in healthy uh, pets, healthy owners. Your animal becomes like your child, and you treat them like your children. If you can't do that, then it's no use having an animal. Yes, you've got to be able to look after them. Stroller's fur just needs to grow back, and she won't be straying far from home again. Off the yard, even the instructions were given to clean up the yard. Two months ago, this young dog was one of three rescued by senior inspector James Murphy and inspector Fox Murray. All three were severely emaciated. It's getting worse, so we've got to do something. <laughs> Two of them, Maxie and Sparky, are still waiting for someone to adopt them. The youngest dog, Cody, has already been lucky. He's really landed on his feet with new owner, Marie Krieger. We needed to find another dog, but we wanted to get a, a puppy, someone that would be playful and get on well with our other dog, so we decided to go to SPCA. The minute I saw him, I knew he was the one for us. The day that I brought him back, he was very nervous, but within two hours, him and um, Spadama, the other dog, were playing and getting along so well. In fact, too well, they spend the entire night up playing, keeping us up at night, crashing into things and knocking over things, making so much noise. He's very loving and quite needy. He's been here a week and a half with me and um, we feed him twice a day, and I thought that he would calm down with food, but he still is so frantic around food, and when I feed the other dogs, he quickly eats all his food, and then he runs to their bowls to eat all their food as well. He's very frantic around food, and he hasn't still learned that, that um, we will always feed him, and that there always will be food. Even though he might have had a bad past, he's still lo so loving and so faithful. I find that rescue dogs, they've just got the best natures out and um, it can really provide you with such a good feeling and fulfillment. Oh! 
At the Cape of Good Hope Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, Chief Inspector Andries Venter has assembled his team. They're going to be working together today on a special operation. We have had problems on Walter Freedom Road, Dana Fontaine, with street vendors of chickens being sold. Hundreds of live chickens are being sold at the side of the road in an unofficial market, and Fenter is convinced they're being cruelly treated. We have tried everything in our power to do something. They are not listening to us. It is Fenter has arranged for armed police road. backup. It so will be a potentially volatile situation when they seize the chickens. It's not unknown for a riot to start up in circumstances like these. Three senior inspectors, pick a side, pick your team, and just go in. Our aim is to get there, load it, and go. We don't mind the people using animals for consumption purposes, but do it right. Don't, don't, don't ignore us and don't try and bypass the system. Senior Inspector James Murphy is well aware of the risks. We're taking chickens away that belong to people and you know, they're not going to be very chuffed about that. Um, so yeah, the, the quicker we do it, the better. Under police escort, the eight inspectors drive the few miles to the market. It's a very low income area. It's known to be violent in, in, in a sense of, of riots have taken place. It is quite a um, dangerous area for us to go into and just remove animals. We're um, arriving at the scene. Uh, cops are blocking off the lane for us. So we're just going to station the vehicles in such a way that we can, if need be, get away quite quickly and efficiently without any injury. When they arrive at the location, the other inspectors can see immediately why Fenter has been so concerned. There are hundreds of chickens in the full glare of the sun. The armed officers are standing by, but the SPCA operation seems to have taken the stallholders by surprise. And so far, everything's peaceful. It's not water, it's not water. It's not water. Dan moet altijd water wees. Ik heb waarschuwings. Ik ga niet. Ik ga niet met die. Ik ga niet met die strijd niet. Ik vaar hier onder. Oké. There's there's no shelter. There's no water available to to these chickens. It's almost 12 o'clock in the afternoon. They still haven't had any water. The conditions are just not acceptable. Wildlife inspector Kira Joshua and trainee inspector Liesel Pino have spotted eight chickens tied together by their legs. Okay, as you can see, uh, um, these chickens are not in good condition. These ones are tight there. As you can see, this one's lying on its, on its back. It can't even get up from it because its legs are tight, so they can't move away. Um, over there, we've got a dead chicken there. And you can see all these chickens have stress. I mean, look at the feathers. It's, it's disgusting. Kira asks Inspector Wilbur Kinkabe to explain to the stallholder why she's taking the birds. Yeah, right now, this is animal cruelty, and we're confiscating the chickens. Yeah, so what Diesel, grab a chicken here quickly. Transportation. Um, that's why they tie them up. It's easier to transport. So it's eight. This guy buys chickens this morning. We're selling chickens. Yeah, you didn't have a transport to take the chickens. No, yes, nobody even armed here. You come in here when Now tempers are beginning to flare. Where's the problem here? Yeah, that guy, he said, that's my chickens. Yeah. 14. Oh, 14, sorry, man. 14 chickens. But you didn't have a transport to take the chickens this morning before you camped in. But now you want this chicken? And you bring the transport. He's not taking his chickens. If, if, if he takes his chicken, okay, he may be arrested and the person allowing him to take it may be arrested as well in terms of the Animal Protection Act. No chickens leave unless we take it. Point blank. I've been shocked when I come here every time. It, it's exactly what I expected, sadly enough. If you look here, I mean, this is a very narrow section. They're sticking the chickens in between this. As you can see there, I mean, it's... They can't move. There's no way they can move. 
and there's wires and things sticking out. It's, it's dangerous and it's, it's not comfortable. You got it? Got it. Fenter and trainee inspector Jacques Buis begin loading the cages into the truck they brought with them. Just check that no feathers or wings yeah. get caught, huh? Yeah. One, two, three. All the birds will go back to the SPCA and they want to get them out of here as soon as possible to avoid any further distress. Yeah. You can see here the, they've just wired these cages up. The floors are all just caving in. I mean, they've got years of chicken excrement all laying at the bottom here. You will have seven days in which to come and sit with us and explain to us how you're going to improve the situation before we give the chickens back. Okay. Is there any fines? Not at this stage, no. He must come and explain to me what exactly he wants me to do because this is my business. Uh, and if he wants me to do specific things, I will do whatever they want me to do because I want to carry on with the business. They've been loading the chickens for two hours now, and Fenter's getting anxious for the health of the birds. It's time to go. It's dehydrated, weak eyes, it's floppy. Can't even stand. Put it in a bucket, give it some water. Um, we found a dead chicken, another dead chicken. We found four chickens dead so far, and that's mainly through overcrowding, lack of water, no shade. Um, yes, horrific conditions, absolutely horrific conditions. I think people need to actually realize where these animals come from, what they go through, to actually put a meal on the table for some people. After three hours' work, every single chicken has been removed from the site. Over 800 of them. Soon, they'll all be at the SPCA, and that's where they'll stay unless conditions improve here. I've asked them to provide constant water feed, regular food, um, to provide a proper shelter against the wind, rain, and all other elements. Most of them said that they would have it up by tomorrow, and we would be checking up on it tomorrow to see if they've complied. SPCA Senior Inspector James Murphy and Trainee Inspector Wayne Hector are in Fissershock on the edge of Cape Town. It's an area of scrub with a few shacks on it. Murphy has received a report that some of the people living there have abandoned their shack, leaving animals behind. Can Wayne take some pictures? When they get there, they realize they're too late to help one of the animals. We've got a dead dog um, on a... Um, I don't know what it is, a makeshift runner thingy. Um, the dog is actually dead, he's pretty much stiff. It appears the owner has simply left the dog to starve. Wayne records the scene for evidence, as it's looking like this could be a criminal cruelty case. <laughs> the young neighbor shows them where the other animals are. He says there are three cats and a kitten. Come here. We're going to just try and catch the cats here. They're a little bit on the wild side, but they're definitely very hungry. Um, so we're going to try and make up a little trap here and then try and catch them. The young man says the people haven't been here for three weeks. It shouldn't be too hard to tempt the cats with the first proper meals they'll have had in that time. Hey, to get them. Actually, Wayne, you know what? There's three in there already. Just push the door closed quickly. <laughs> Got it. There we go. Trainee Wayne can learn a lot from an experienced inspector like James Murphy. Murphy's been at the SPCA for 18 years. Hey, come here. There's another dog that somehow managed to survive. He's understandably fearful. Come on. Come on. Good doggy. Good doggy. There you go. Come on. Let's come out of here. Come. The dog's not friendly, but that may be just because he's been mistreated and is starving. 
He'll be examined by the vet at the SPCA. Cheeky. And look how skinny you are. He's got ticks on him as well. And you're going to bite me. I, I can see that. Come on, let's go. Come. Finally, the dead dog's corpse will be taken back for the vets to determine a cause of death. Murphy used to work in the SPCA hospital, and on closer examination, he sees signs of tick bite fever. Basically, ticks carry the virus uh, um, to the dog from other dogs, so and yeah, it basically kills off the red blood cells, and, and the dog eventually dies without treatment. Um, doesn't take take much to pick up a phone and, and, and phone somebody and say, like, you know, please help, my animal's dying. Training to become an inspector has meant Wayne facing some shocking new experiences. I've always heard of dogs dying on a chain, but this is my actual first time I saw it. And to me, it's, uh, people is just plain, plain cruel. To, just to let the dog fend for himself, but he's on a chain. He can't go look for food even. I think that's a, this is a case there where, where people they're just, they're just ignorant towards animal welfare. At this stage, we've got three cats and, and the, the one dog. Um, I think there's an, I saw another cat. We need to try and find that one. I'm going to leave the owner a warning to say that we've confiscated his animals. And then uh, when he responds, um, we can then discuss the situation with him. And some people, they just don't respond at all. They just, uh, well, SPCA has taken my dogs, so what, you know? I'll get another one later, you know. So it's coming, we might have to kind of follow up on it, uh, you know, in a short while to check what, what's happening. Wayne, well, you need to grab us a net. I'm trying to catch that little kitten. There's another little grey one there. He's come back now. They don't want to leave without the kitten. Oh, how did he get there? Hello, no, no, kitty, come, come. No, no, he's running away. Come. Come. You're going to go around the back? Yeah. Go around the back and then just chase him this chase way. Him this way. It's getting in out through the roof here. Yeah. It almost came out now. Okay, just right in there. Whoa! Oh, come, kitty, come. Okay, okay. Okay. Got him. <laughs> Have you got him? Yeah. Just this. Oh, there we go. Careful, be careful, he's gonna bite this. Okay, you got him. Okay, okay, okay. Just walk into the van. Okay, okay. The kitten doesn't know yet how lucky he is. He'll soon be getting all the food and care he needs at the SPCA. At the Cape of Good Hope Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, 800 chickens urgently need a temporary new home. We're just setting up uh, chicken coops for the um, chickens that we brought back um, so that they're safe and secure until um, we've decided what, what we're going to do with them. We've uh, created quite a bit of space, although um, we did not anticipate about 800 odd chickens but we are making good grounds, I think. <laughs> this is cannibalism. This is basically what the chickens do in the battery cages. When they find a little red spot, they start pecking at it and pecking at it, and uh, the chickens end up like this. Um, when they see blood, they just peck and peck and peck, and, and, and the chickens end up getting injured like this. Um, it's, uh, it'll never heal and eventually the chickens, you know, they just keep producing eggs and when the farm is finished with them, this is where they end up um, after 65 weeks and uh, they end up uh, um, yeah, being sold in the street corners with the wounds looking like this. The chickens will all stay here for now, with the shade, water and space they should have had all along. There are 93 SPCAs in South Africa, along with many other organizations working to protect animals. Wildlife Inspector Kira Joshua has received a call from two conservation officers responsible for a stretch of coastline near the Cape of Good Hope. They've spotted an injured seal and they need assistance. There are millions of seals living off the southern African coast, most of them Cape fur seals. Kira realizes straight away that this is a rarer beast. This is a different seal to the one that we normally find, the Cape fur seal. This is a sub-Antarctic seal. 
Sub-Antarctic seals normally live in the South Atlantic and the Southern Indian Ocean. This one's a long way from home. He's too weak to react to the presence of humans. Normally they would be rearing up in that already. Um, he's got an injury on the, the left eye and it does seem to be quite emaciated. And this is an adult seal, so that's why we're going to need to use the, the net at the moment. It's basically tapers at the end, so it allows the, the head to fit in where it can't open its mouth because you basically don't want to get bitten by the seal. You can lift the bottom part. Okay, brilliant. Okay. okay. A healthy male weighs up to 130 kilos. In his emaciated condition, this one's a lot less than that, but he's still a heavy load to carry up the beach. They want to determine as quickly as possible what the seal's problems are and what can be done to help him. Kira's arranged for a veterinarian to be on standby at the SPCA in Grassy Park and for a scientist from Marine and Coastal Management to meet them there. Thanks. Thanks for coming out, eh? Thanks. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, pleasure. The seal's going to go through now to the SPCA, so we need to actually quite hurry now. I mean, it's going to get checked out by the vet. Grassy Park's not far away, but every moment counts if they're to avoid distressing the animal. Vet George Birch is waiting for them. The first thing he looks at is the damaged eye. It looks like an old um, healing ulcer. It looks like connective tissue that's uh, congregating there in the cornea on the, on the outer layer of the eye. If it's active, you know, in a dog, we, we would, uh, on a daily basis, two to three times a day, actually put uh, ointment on there. But because it's a seal we're going to release, we don't have that uh, luxury. Kira's job now is to hold the seal steady whilst George examines him. This one, he's, he's quite strong, so this is good. Well, good for him, but bad for us right now because he still needs to finish the clinical. The seal needs fluids to help with rehydration. This is going to be 200, so I'd prefer if we can give an, at least another 100. Um, so okay, now we can just do the eye. Okay. You can see there's nothing staining on that eye, so that's good news. Yeah, there's, no ulcer. Okay. there's no ulceration of the eye. It seems like it's just a scratch that will heal by itself. Stephen McHugh from Marine and Coastal Management takes a DNA sample before tagging the seal. Okay. This is just for genetic purposes, yeah. for identification as well, just 100% sure that it was a subantarctic. I just need to get to both flippers now. The tags will enable them to identify the seal if he's found again. Do you want me to get That's up? Fine. Okay. Having confirmed that the eye injury is not serious, and with fluids and vitamins to help him recover, they can get him back to the sea. They've chosen a quiet area of the Cape Point Nature Reserve. A younger seal might have been taken to the Marine Research Centre at Sea Point to recover, but that's not suitable for a grown-up like this. His best chance is to go straight back into the wild. Okay, go. They don't want to handle him any more than absolutely necessary or stress him out by their presence. They'll lay him on the sand and retreat. Over here, he's not going to be stressed out by people and being in a different environment. Um, I know it looks quite bad now, but we're just going to have to see. I mean, over here, he's going to have more of a chance than being in captivity right now. The question is, Will he be well enough to make it to the water and start swimming? There are many anxious minutes as he seems reluctant to move. Then suddenly, he seems to get a new lease of life. It's all emotional. <laughs> All moved away and now the seal is in the water. Over there. Is it up? Is it down? 
So as, as long as you know that, you know, he's still able to swim and everything. So that's good. Oh, it's a brilliant ending. Trainee Inspector Wayne Hector and Senior Inspector James Murphy are back at the SPCA with the abandoned animals they found in Fissershock. All of them will get a checkup from the vet. Miles Penfold begins with the dog. This guy's quite lively here. Um, so, yeah, he's definitely on the thin side. We'll pop this one through into, into general ward. Uh, only thing really wrong with this one is it hasn't, hasn't had any food, so it's just straight neglect. Um, really, otherwise clinically quite well, it needs to be uh, de-ticked and um, that's about all. Okay, kitty. While George Birch takes a look at the adult cats, Miles assesses the kitten that proved the hardest to catch. Just a, a basic health, health check, is checking the uh, lymph nodes behind the ears, see if he's just giving me indications of any sickness or anything going on in, in the body. This cat probably could do with quite a bit more food, um, but, but definitely not totally emaciated. Okay, so she's pretty good. Uh, definitely will be considered for adoption, and uh, if it passes all the behavioral assessments and stuff, uh, be, be a good ending. As their companion apparently died from tick bite fever, all the animals could be in danger from the disease. They'll be put into quarantine and watch closely over the next few days. Now James Murphy has one more job for today, in a rural area north of Cape Town. He's received a call from a woman who thinks her neighbour has moved out, leaving a collection of animals behind with no one to care for them. There's no feeding place, there's no shelter. The signs aren't good. They started emptying out the dustbins, and that's where we got a little catchy because this guy came and told my sister's fiance that he's moving out. And we found six dead chickens, and the pigs started eating on them because they were so hungry. And that's where we no, no, started. Pigs will eat uh, dead chickens. So. That's where we started thinking that there's something wrong. Okay, let's go and see. Bit of a mess, yeah. I'm just wondering what this guy is actually doing. What well, isn't doing? There's no feeding bowls, nothing. Here's where the chickens used to sleep. Oh, there we go. There's a dead chicken, yeah? As chicken's actually very, very emaciated. Um, I'm reckoning it died. My first impression is starvation. If you want animals, you look after them. You know, you don't rely on somebody just to kind of feed your animals or just hope that somebody will feed them. And it sounds like this guy's lifestyle doesn't suit this sort of arrangement. I mean, he's, there's nobody here, you know, to care for them. I mean, there you've got a Looks like a pregnant sow. Who knows where she's going to end up having a baby because there's no adequate space for them. It makes me cross because I don't feel f this is a way for animals to live. And it's not right what he's doing. If he doesn't want the animals, there's a lot of people around here with open hearts who will take care of it, but he doesn't make plan to give it away or do anything of that concern for the animals. In a muddy makeshift pool, Murphy can just about make out some fish. I've just seen a, what looks like a goldfish. Kids were saying these ones with little whiskers, so it's possible barble. I don't know how we're going to get these out of here. Where and why the owner's gone is a mystery, but the animals shouldn't have been left like this. Murphy leaves a 24-hour warning notice. Chances are he's not going to respond within the 24-hour period. So I say we've got to make plans uh, for, the, for, the, for that, in the eventuality that he doesn't respond, because this can turn out to be a whole day's affair, <laughs> trying to round up all these animals. There will be a team standing by tomorrow. They could have a busy day ahead of them. Animal care assistant Taryn Boyce is paying a visit to the cats that were abandoned in Fissershock. They've been at the SPCA for three days now. I was a volunteer when I started. I've been here three and a half years, more or less, and I've always been in the cat tree. Every time a cat comes in, they call me. <laughs> We're in the quarantine cat tree. Um, they're kept here for seven to 10 days for, to, to, for me to monitor their health. 
and if everything is okay with them. Once the seven to 10 days is up, we will move them to our adoption center. We will try and find them homes. At the moment, we can't move them. When he came in, he was terrified. He was hiding behind the bed at the back there, um, shaking. And now he's rubbing up against me. And his nose is pink. It means he's been in the sun a lot. Nobody put any sunblock on. It's very important to put sunblock on pink noses. Um, their coats are very, very soft and they're not dull. They're very, they're in good condition other, other than that. The cats weren't living in the healthiest conditions. So yes. Taryn and the vets will be watching them closely for any signs of illness. For the moment though, they're looking good and Taryn's main concern is getting them socialized. They'll make um, very good adoptions. Just the people who adopt them need to take care of their noses. That's very important by putting sunblock on. Um, yeah, very affectionate. They'll be good to go to a family with kids, definitely, because they'll have to be held. They're all lovely, uh, gorgeous. 24 hours ago, SPCA inspectors seized 800 chickens from an unofficial roadside market. The chickens were in cramped, filthy cages, without food or water, and in the full glare of the sun. Now, Senior Inspector James Murphy and Trainee Inspector Jacques Buis are back to see if the stall holders are keeping their promises to improve conditions. Water, then food, and then water. No, no, no. There must always be water. There are fewer stalls than yesterday, but those that have turned up have begun to make improvements. Okay, they've complied with food and water on the stall, but no shelter. Now we've got some water here. They've got the roof over their heads. There's food. A free range. Yeah, it's an improvement. Water containers. You see, they've all got water containers in the corners. Yeah. Okay, so the chickens can kind of get there. You've got cages here with 12 in it, and you've got three at the bottom. Maybe if you can restrict it to maybe six in a cage. Why do you need to lock the chickens in the cages? Why can't you have them free range? That chicken is not used to walk on the ground. They was grown up in cages like this. Yeah. So why do you have to put them back in cages like that? The chickens need to be free. So give them, give, give, let them enjoy them. The, the, they're going to go get slaughtered. What must we Take do? them out, put them on the ground, let them scratch around like chickens are supposed to do. It's just kind of changing his mindset. He thinks that because they come from a battery cage, they must stay in a battery cage. And they don't know about the, 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 the scratching and that sort of thing. But it's instinct for a chicken to start scratching around. And the, and the food and water thing, I mean, instead of trying to cut little bowls out of plastic things and trying to get the chickens, uh, you know, put it in the cage, um, they can have the bowls loose on the ground and the chickens can uh, um, peck and eat from there. Some of the customers haven't quite got the animal welfare message yet. Hello? Why are you tying his legs? You carry him under your arm. You're walking. And you don't carry him like that either. Do you carry your children like that? I, if it's this, running, okay, you do, are do, not do you know what, what? What is this? It's a chicken. It's a chicken. It's a life. He's got a heart. He's got a mind. Yeah, okay? But... He's got feeling. Just like you. Okay? The chicken's got to put food on their, on their plate and, and the, you know, the least they could do is respect it until it's actually dead. That's it. It's your baby. When you cut his head off, then it's fine. You can chuck him around. Sure. Yeah. And then, um... It's getting better, but it's kind of the proof is in the pudding. We'll see whether this, this continues or whether it's actually going to deteriorate again, whether they're just going to eventually you know, stuff it. SPCA is not coming here, but... We're going to really seriously monitor this on a, on a regular basis and make sure that these uh, conditions continue to improve. Murphy's day is far from over yet. He's called for reinforcements to meet him at the small holding north of Cape Town, where a collection of animals seem to have been abandoned. He's received no call from the owner, so he's decided to take some action. And with seven pot-bellied pigs and numerous chickens to catch, Murphy needs all the help he can get. What I want to do is actually put some food in here and try and get the chickens in here. 
At first, Murphy's plan appears to be working. Come. Dip, 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 dip. Ah, there goes the rooster. Oh, my hat. Where is this rooster going to? There's no easy way to catch a rooster that doesn't want to be caught. Moya, come in. OK, Wayne, come this way. Guys, come in quickly. Just close the door, close the door. There we go. OK, boxes. Find the father pig, and this we've got two babies in there, and one I see running around. And then the fish is there, and it'll be a bit of a mission. At the at the stage, we're just draining most of the water to see whether we can, you know, get to see the fish in, in amongst that pea soup. The water in the pool is filthy, but trainee inspector Wayne Hector has struck lucky. Wayne just caught a, um, a trout in the water with the net. Purely by luck, I suppose. <laughs> Just wading through the water to see if there's any big fish around. There's another one. That makes seven. Whoa. Well, the condition of the water, as you can see, is pretty disgusting. I mean, all the fish that we've caught, they've come... Okay, fish are normally a little bit slimy, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> they are all, like, mucky. I'm sure the oxygen content in the water is seriously depleted. This probably contains more fish poo than anything else, which isn't really very really nutritious for any fishes. There's Daddy! Oh my word! He's a big boy! The male pig has returned from his foraging on the edge of the property. Uh, come on! He's gonna break this net if he goes into it. No, he will. He will. Wayne, Wayne, Wayne! Liesel, that way. Come in. Come in now. Hey. Come inside. He's surprisingly accommodating and soon joins his family in the pen. Well done, guys. OK, we've got like three chickens left, I think. Let's go for the chickens. How many are there? There's two. There was a third one, I'm sure. Moyo, go wide, go wide. Get him, Moyo, get him, Moyo. There you go. Go for Moyo. Moyo. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I got him. <laughs> OK, Wayne, Wayne, slow down, slow down. Where is he? Should we give him a break? They've been here just over an hour, and all the animals are safely contained. Now they just need to transfer them to the trucks. We've got a little plan to get the pigs from the little pen here now, um, down at a sort of a race and into the, into the horse box without uh, uh, having to stress them out too much, because now we've got the whole family here, and then we just need to block the exits as we go along with uh, boards and sheeting and stuff like that. Right, all hands on deck. Come, eat. Eat, Mama. Come. Come, Yelit. Come. Come, Papa. OK. So far, so good. Oh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> we Did can get, get the pair, one of the parents, and I think the rest will follow. Why are you coming? Why are you coming? Okay, okay, okay. Oh, my head. Oh. Okay. Oh, they're getting us. Come on, big boy. Okay. Okay, now just wondering how far they ran away. They go onto that field again. Ah, uh, shoot. James, there's one also roaming in that field over there. We'll get them one at a time. Moyo, he's coming your way. Free. There you go. Thank <laughs> <laughs> Oh, slide down, Moyo, slide down. Go, leave him. Let him. Let him go for the gap. One more to go. Ah, oh, look if you get... Catch him, are you? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> it's going towards the road, man. Where is he? He's running along the road. It's all yours, are you? OK. It's yours. OK, all right. Donkey, come Wayne. Last one.
Finally we can go. The inspectors and the animals have all had a little more exercise than they bargained for, but the run will have done them no harm, and they'll be back at the SPCA by nightfall. Two days later, and there's a pleasant surprise for Murphy. The SARS had uh, babies over the weekend, um, four little ones here, uh, really cute and she's very protective over them. So we'll just keep our distance here. They're cute but not cuddly. The owners called Murphy and admitted he wasn't caring for the animals properly because his job was taking him away from home. He's agreed that the SPCA can find new homes for them. Ideally it would be a, a, um, a farm uh, that's just gonna look after them and till their dying day. Um, yeah, that would be first prize. You basically have to find a suitable person, check out the property, make sure that they have the suitable accommodation for the pigs, and then if the application is approved, then we will have the pigs out. When a school is located next door to a nature reserve, you have to be prepared for some unexpected visitors. And that's when you need a wildlife inspector like Kira Joshua. There's a mongoose on the loose, and Kira's brought trainee inspector Liesel Pinar to help her trap it. The mongoose has taken refuge in the girls' toilets. The principal just explained now they're busy cutting the grass behind you. Maybe that's the reason why it probably came into the, the school grounds here. We're going to leave the box open on the, on the one end over there. I'm going to try and chase it towards the box. The main aim is not to actually physically handle the animal and let him go in by itself. There are 11 species of mongoose in South Africa. This one's a Cape Grey. Well, here is the toilet. Coming up the toilet. Yes, let's go for the window. Oh, there you go. Mongooses are renowned for their bravery, so Kira and Liesel have to be careful that it doesn't decide to attack them. He's here by this bottle, he's refusing to move. That was close. What's suggested now is then that we put the box over here because the last cubicle over here, it's, it's blocked at the bottom, so he's not going to run out. So therefore, it's only one way. So we feel like a noise and disturbance, and hopefully then he runs down and just sees the box. He shouldn't be able to push through there. OK, well, let's go. Come in. Oh. It does not like this box. He's trying to push through your side. Close. Got him. Brilliant. Success. Now he just needs a quick checkup. The original call was that it was an injured mongoose caught here in the girls' toilet. Um, so I'm just going to check him out now, see if there is anything wrong with him. If there's not, then we can just take him straight and release him. Or um, if he is injured, we'll take him through to the SPCA to have him looked at. It's using its back legs and that. It's standing on it. It doesn't look like it's favoring any leg or anything. Um, so I don't think it would be necessary then to take it through to the SPCA. As the children get an impromptu natural history lesson, Kira gets permission to release the mongoose back into the nature reserve. Listen, we got a mongoose um, here at Zikuflay Primary School. It's not injured or anything. Can we come through to release? <laughs> as you could see in the box as well, he was using his hand. He wasn't favouring any, any leg or anything. Um, he seemed fine. 
he's home, but this time on the opposite side of the nature reserve to the school. It's just over a week since Murphy and trainee inspector Wayne Hector rescued four cats and a dog from the yard of a shack in Fissershock. The animals were all emaciated, and they also found another dog that tests showed had died from tick bite fever. Murphy's back today with trainee inspector Jacques Buis. So they haven't been here for a while. The shack's still empty, and the notice James left is still there. Everything is stuck as it basically as it was when we took the dogs. James sees if the neighbours can shed any light on where the owners have gone. Apparently the owners of the, that we've taken the dogs from, um, they're apparently vagrants and they're wandering around Parklands. Uh, so I think the only thing we, we can do now is just go and lay the charges and wait for the court case if, and the police can go and find him. Meanwhile, at the SPCA, Animal care assistants Tarin Boyce and Tembi Nomkala are concerned about the health of the rescued cats. Some of them had ticks, and they want to make sure they're not carrying the same fever that killed the dog. 39.2. 39.2. Normal temperature is around 38.5, 38.8. Tembi takes a blood smear for examination by vet Miles Penfold. He's a boy. We just have to do the other two now. The smears confirm Taryn and Tembi's fears. This one has definitely got tick bite fever. What I'm going to look for now is also during this is just check have they got the other tick-borne um, uh, disease that we commonly see, uh, Hemobartonella, and uh, at this point in time I can't find it. Most animals can survive tick bite fever if they are treated in time. The cats will be kept in quarantine and they'll get all the care they need in the hope that they can pull through. It hasn't taken long for the piglets that were born at the SPCA to begin finding new homes. Maureen Weeks was first in the queue for one of them. I got Shakespeare because I already have a pig called Belladonna. She's a Vietnamese pot belly. She's nine years old. And, um, and um, when I heard about these pigs being um, rescued, I thought, well, I've got a beautiful house um, for Belladonna and it would be perfect to have another little pig or big pig, whatever the case may be. And I know that it would have a wonderful home with me. There we go. I just think they're just marvelous animals. They're, they're intelligent, they're clean, they are not smelly, and they're just delightful. Say hello, Bella, Donna. Bella, here's your friend Shakespeare. He's trying to suckle her, and she's really not interested in that. She doesn't understand what this little one wants from her. That's going to be your house, my young man. Okay. Okay, Bella. Come on. Once he's over the, the, the weaning stage, they, they will get on very nicely um, and, and be big companions once he stops trying to find the teats. And you're going to live here happily ever after, huh? You know? The 800 chickens that were seized from a roadside market have been at the SPCA for eight days. An agreement has been reached with the stallholders. OK, we've just had a meeting with the, uh, all the owners of the chickens. We've discussed what we require in terms of uh, improvements at, at the vending site. And they're keen to comply with that. And the fate of the chickens has been decided in that they will be going to the abattoir for slaughter within the next day or two. And the monies will then be uh, distributed amongst the owners of the chickens. As an SPCA, we can't allow the chickens to go back into those circumstances. So we're basically doing the best option for the chickens. These are end of lay chickens. Man has kind of stuck them into battery cages and expected them to pop eggs uh, uh, day in and day out for 65 weeks and then just dispose of them because they're useless and they're not making money. In the humane sense, it's not, not acceptable, but uh, uh, 
commercially it is acceptable and, and uh, we as the SPCA would love to stop this battery chicken practice. James and the other inspectors will continue to monitor the market so that in future all chickens are sold in humane and healthy conditions. Come on. Three months ago, Senior Inspector Murphy rescued a dog, three cats and a kitten after their owner abandoned them at a shack in Fissishog. Okay, at the SPCA, the cats recovered from tick bite fever and they've all been adopted. The kitten has grown up a bit and moved in with Carol and Jonietta Curtsy and their older cat, Jack. We had an older great tabby that had a heart condition since he was young and he died and obviously we were quite sad and We've, we've got another cat, uh, and he was with Audi's brother. And we decided to not waste any time and to go to the SPCA to adopt. She was just so tiny, and she looked like a little pixie. I took her out of the cage and I held her, and she just lied like she did now, you know? So she is extremely playful. She plays with anything she can get fingers, toes, anything that looks like a mouse. When I work on my laptop, she chases the, the mouse pointer on the, on the screen. Jack's still getting used to her. He doesn't know what to do with little girls around. Yes, I mean, she wants to play with him and he doesn't want anything he... to do with her at this point. Jack's a grumpy old man. Yes, there he is. <laughs> you can't replace the cats that, that you have lost. Each of them has their own little personality. It's been a while since we had a kitten in the house, so, uh, you know, she's a lot of fun and she keeps us busy. She's definitely filling the void. 